In 1947, the tranquil town of Maine is rocked by a shocking murder. The prime suspect in the case is a local banker named Andy Dufresne. Despite his vehement protests of innocence, the court convicts him and sentences him to two consecutive life sentences, and he is sent to Shashank Prison, a notorious institution that is known for breaking even the strongest of men. Meanwhile, Red, a convicted killer, is interviewed for parole after spending 20 years in Shashank. Despite his sincere efforts to show that he has turned over a new leaf, the parole board rejects his plea. Disheartened, Red returns to his routine in prison, which involves smuggling in contraband items for his fellow inmates in exchange for money. When a new batch of inmates arrives at Shank Redden, his friends place bets on who will crack under the immense pressure of prison life. Red places his wager on Andy, who seems calm and composed on the surface but harbors a deep sense of despair. Inside, however, it is not Andy, but an obese inmate who breaks down and cries uncontrollably. On his first night, the inmates' cries attract the attention of Captain Hadley, a sadistic guard who takes pleasure in brutalizing the prisoners. Hadley unleashes his fury on the hapless men, beating him mercilessly for hours. The following morning, the inmates learn that the obese guide died in the infirmary from his injuries as the prison doctor was out for the night. This stunt Andy and he tries to ask about the man's name, but everyone tells him to mind his own business. A month passes by and one day Andy approaches Red after hearing that he can smuggle things into the prison. He asks Red to get him a rock hammer, saying he wants it to pursue his hobby of collecting and sculpting rocks. Red wonders if he intends to use the hammer to engineer an escape but Andy laughs off the suggestion so. Red accepts the order but also warns Andy about the sisters, led by Boggs, who assault other prisoners. Soon, it becomes clear that Boggs has a major crush on Andy. During the first two nights of his incarceration, Andy spends most of his time working in the laundry or fighting off Boggs and the sisters. Despite the hardships, he finds solace in his friendship with Red. Together, they pass their time in conversation, sharing their hopes and dreams. When a job vacancy to tar the roof of a prison building is announced, Red pulls some strings to get Andy and their other friends on the job. One day, Andy overhears Hadley complaining about having to pay taxes for an upcoming inheritance. Using his extensive experience as a banker, he advises Hadley to shelter his money from the IRS by turning it into a one-time gift for his wife, also offers to help him file the paperwork in exchange for chilled beers for his fellow inmates. The arrogant captain appears to be angry at first, but after seeing Andy's intelligence, he agrees to the deal. Over time, Andy builds good relations with everyone in the prison, making him more comfortable and confident. He also starts to read and increases his knowledge. Sometime later, he approaches Red with another strange demand. He wants a poster of the actress Rita Hayworth. Red is definitely a bit weird out by it, but nonetheless he agrees without asking anything. I guess she was hot in the 40s later. Andy runs into the sisters who again try to force themselves on him, but this time he confidently challenges them, saying he isn't afraid to die. He even threatens to bite off their manhoods if they come any closer to him I bite teka bite your dick. The sisters are taken aback by his courage and so they decide against testing his threat. However, they beat him to a pulp, putting him in the infirmary for a month. As a result, Boggs is given solitary confinement and when he comes out, he is beaten by Hadley and his men. The beating is so severe that he permanently becomes handicapped and is transferred to a prison hospital. Box's gang members also move on and leave Andy alone for good. When Andy is finally released from the infirmary, Red and the others gift him a bunch of sculptable rocks and a giant poster of Rita Hayworth. Soon Warden Samuel Norton learns about Andy's skills and uses a surprise cell inspection to meet him. He finds him reading the Bible and discusses his favorite verses as the guards turn the cell upside down for smuggled goods. After failing to find anything illegal, Norton encourages Andy to keep reading the Bible, saying that salvation lies within. Later Andy learns that he has been assigned to work in the prison library as the assistant of an aging inmate, Brooks Halton. In return, he gives financial advice to the prison guards and helps them file their income tax returns. I wish I was in prison with Andy. One day he gets an idea to expand the prison library to help other inmates broaden their horizons. On Norton's advice, he asks the Maine State Senate for funds by writing letters every week. Over time, he becomes so popular that even the guards from other prisons seek his service. When they visit Shawano for an inter-prison baseball tournament, Andy also becomes Norton's personal financial advisor. One day something takes over Brooks and he holds an inmate hostage, threatening to kill him. It's then revealed that Brooks, after serving a staggering 50 years behind bars, is due to be released from Shank Prison. But as the reality of freedom looms before him, he finds himself unable to cope with the outside world. He feels lost, terrified, and alone, convinced that he will never be able to adapt to life on the outside. In a desperate attempt to cling on to the only life he's ever known, Brooks resorts to drastic measures, taking a fellow prisoner hostage. But in the midst of the chaos, Andy steps forward and convinces Brooks to calm down. 
he reminds them that there's still a whole world waiting for him beyond the prison walls. Later, Andy discusses the incident with Red, and the latter comments that Brooks has become institutionalized after spending 50 years at Shank, he has become essentially conditioned to be a prisoner for the rest of his life and is unable to adapt to the outside world. Red says that. These walls are funny, first you hate him, then you get used to them, enough time passes you get, so you depend on them. In the next scene, Brooks is eventually paroled, despite his wish to continue staying at the prison. As he steps out, he stares in awe at the towering buildings and bustling crowds, feeling overwhelmed by the sudden change of environment, he has no family or friends waiting for him, no place to call home, and no purpose to live for. The only thing familiar to him is his old routine, the routine of a prisoner, and the memories of the Shashank prison flood his mind. Desperate to cling onto something familiar, Brooks takes up a job at a local supermarket, but he finds himself struggling to keep up with the fast pace and demands of the outside world. People around him talk and behave differently, and he cannot seem to understand their ways. As days go by, Brooks's depression deepens, and he begins to feel hopeless about his future. Finally, unable to cope with the overwhelming emotions, Brooks commits the unthinkable, leaving behind a message Brooks was here on the wooden beam. Six long and grueling years pass by, and Andy's persistence in writing letters to the state legislature finally pays off. The prison is granted $200 to fund the expansion of the library along with a collection of old and tattered books and phonograph records among them, and he discovers a copy of Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro, determined to share this musical masterpiece with his fellow inmates, and he devises a risky plan. While working in the warden's office, he seizes the opportunity to lock the guard in the washroom and play the record over the prison's loudspeaker system. As the notes of the opera fill the stale air of the prison, an extraordinary thing happens, the inmates, including the toughest of criminals, are swept away by the beauty of the music. Even the guards can't help but smile at the sheer power of the performance. Unfortunately, Andy's act of defiance doesn't go unnoticed, and he is sentenced to two weeks in solitary confinement. Despite the punishment, he remains steadfast in his belief that hope is the key to survival, and he refuses to let the brutal conditions of Shashank break him. Sometime later, Red appears for yet another parole hearing after living in prison for 30 years. Unfortunately, the authorities once again reject him. To cheer him up, Andy gives him a harmonica to mark his 30 years. In return, Red gives him a giant poster of Marilyn Monroe to commemorate his 10 years here you go, you pervert. After the Mozart incident, the state gives Zandi a budget of $500 to expand the library. He uses the meager fund wisely and signs, deals with book clubs and charities to create the best prison library in Maine, and names it after the late Brooks. With the improved infrastructure, Andy starts to tutor inmates who wish to get their high school diplomas so that they can get decent jobs when they are released from prison. Meanwhile, the warden enriches himself by exploiting Andy's knowledge and banking expertise. Soon, he begins profiting by forcing the inmates as cheap laborers for public projects which he easily wins by outbidding his competitors. To hide Norton's ill-gotten wealth from the law, Andy sets up accounts in several banks using the identity of an imaginary man, Randall Stevens, who only exists on paper. Andy created this fake user with his extensive knowledge of the system and mail-order forms. Although Randall Stevens doesn't exist in real life, he has a birth certificate, social security number, and driving license. The plan is foolproof, and if the law ever investigates the matter, they will chase a man that only exists on paper. The movie then fast forwards to the year 1965. A young man named Tommy is sentenced to two years at Shawano for breaking and entering. Tommy is a fun and charismatic man. He has been going in and out of jail since he was 13 years old. He soon befriends Zandi and Red and the three form a cohesive bond. One day, Tommy asks Sandy to help him in earning his high school equivalency diploma. The latter immediately agrees and hence they start their preparations. After months of hard work and perseverance, Tommy eventually sits for the exam. However, by the end of the test, he gets frustrated over his performance and tosses his answer sheet in the trash. Nevertheless, Andy retrieves it and sends it to the education board. In the next scene, Red confronts Tommy and berates him for his recklessness, reminding him of the time and effort Andy has invested in helping him earn his high school equivalency diploma don't be a dumb bitch. Tommy finally realizes the gravity of his mistake and apologizes, then he drops a bombshell. During his time at another prison, he shared a cell with a man who had confessed to killing a golfer and his lover. The men frequently bragged about how he framed an innocent banker for it. Hearing this, Andy is taken aback as he realizes that the banker is none other than himself. He immediately goes to the warden to ask for a new trial with Tommy as a witness. However, the corrupt warden, afraid of losing his easy source of profit, refuses to help him and instead punishes him with a month of solitary confinement. During this time, Tommy receives his high school diploma. Unfortunately, a few days later, 
He is escorted out of the prison and executed by Hadley to stop him from helping Andy get out of prison. The warden then visits Andy in solitary confinement and tells him about Tommy's passing, claiming that he got shot dead while trying to escape. As expected, Andy doesn't buy this, and he refuses to help Norton launder money anymore. However, the warden threatens him with dire consequences, including shutting down the library should he stop working for him. After Andy is released from solitary confinement, he opens up to R.A. about his past and the love of his life, his late wife. He shares how his work and ambition drove her away and how he feels responsible for her death, even though he didn't pull the trigger. Overwhelmed with regret and longing, Andy reveals his ultimate dream to Red to escape to a small beach town in Mexico called Zizerwatendo, where he can finally live a peaceful and simple life. He invites Red to join him there one day, and he also tells him about a specific area in Buxton, Maine, where he has hidden something. He wants Red to retrieve it when he is released. As the days pass by, Andy resumes his shady work for Norton and this worries Red. The smuggler's worries are heightened further when he learns that Andy has asked a fellow inmate for a six-foot rope. Reset assumes the worst and fears that his friend may commit the unthinkable. The next day, Andy doesn't answer the regular morning call and lo and behold, it's revealed that he is missing from his cell. Soon, it is discovered that he had dug a tunnel using a jackhammer hidden behind the poster. It turns out he had ordered the poster to hide the tunnel. A flashback then reveals that he hid the dirt from the wall in his pockets, which he emptied into the courtyard. During his morning walks the previous night, Andy packed many of Norton's papers and clothes into a plastic bag, which he tied to himself with the rope. As Norton and others try to wrap their heads around the escape, Andy visits all of Norton's banks posing as Randall Stevens and withdraws all the money. He also sends a proof of Norton's illegal deeds to the National Daily not long after chaos erupts at Shank Prison as the police and media swarm the area. Hadley is immediately arrested for the murder of Tommy, and the other corrupt officials are also taken into custody. The evidence that Andy had sent to the National Daily proves to be damning, and soon the authorities begin to unravel the web of corruption that had been woven by Norton and his cohorts. But before the police can arrest Norton, he commits the unthinkable to avoid the humiliation of being exposed. In the end, Justice is served and Andy's legacy lives on as a symbol of hope and perseverance in the face of injustice. Some time later, Red receives an anonymous postcard from Fort Hancock, Texas, and his heart races with anticipation as he reads it. It is a brief message from his old friend Andy, telling him that he finally made it to his dream. Destination Awanajo Red feels a mix of emotions. He is happy that Andy has achieved his long-held dream of freedom and starting anew, but at the same time, he is sad that he won't have his friend around anymore. He can't help but wonder how Andy is faring if he is happy. If he still thinks about his time in Shashank. As he stares at the postcard, he remembers Andy's words. Some birds are not meant to be caged because their feathers are too bright. Red smiles through his tears knowing that Andy is one of those birds and feels grateful for the time they spent together. The scene then cuts to Red's parole hearing in 1967. This time he doesn't try to impress the board. Instead, he tells them in contempt how rehabilitated is just a made-up word invented to justify their having a job. He also earnestly expresses regrets for his actions of the past. Red says that he will have to live with that for the rest of his life. At last, he asks the board to stop wasting his time and to leave him alone. To his astonishment, Red's parole is approved this time around. He is then housed in the same room where Brooks took his own life. Moreover, Red starts working at the same supermarket like Brooks. There are moments when he considers committing a crime so that he can be sent to prison, but every time he remembers the promise he made to Andy. Ultimately, he visits Buxton and finds the stone wall where Andy had hidden. Something it is revealed to be a small box containing a large sum of cash and instructions to come find him in Zoa 10 Nero. In the letter, Andy says that he really looks forward to seeing him, as he needs somebody who can get things for a project of his. Red finally realizes the power of hope and optimism before leaving. He carves a message on the wooden beam which now says Brooks was here, so was Red. Despite violating his parole, Red feels liberated as he crosses the border at Fort Hancock, leaving behind the oppressive past that held him back for so long. He looks forward to reuniting with Andy and embarking on a new adventure, knowing that his friend has given him the gift of hope and the strength to pursue his dreams. The movie ends as the two friends finally reunite on the Pacific Coast beach, making for a happy ending.